pattern just quickly today is uh, we have some very uh, brilliant speakers who are going to kind of offer some provocations to stimulate our thinking. Uh, there will be one that's coming up shortly from Graham Marshall. Um, and then we'll go into conversation and then back a little bit of feedback, um, go back into a provocation and then back into conversation. Um, and after each provocation, you'll get an opportunity to ask one or two questions of the speakers just to again inform the, the thinking. And so the first uh, speaker is Graham Marshall. He was to be joined by uh, his partner, Rhiannon Corcoran. Who has who's got a very busy schedule that's been shifting around because of all of this COVID nineteen pandemic, and Rihanna isn't able to join us right now, but hopefully might join us for the conversation segments. So uh, so, uh, but it's great to see you, Graham. Graham is an architect um, who has been spending his time changing and improving places. Um, he has established the Pro Social Place program in 2020, 2012 and is currently expert advisor to the High Streets Task Force and a ministerial advisory group for architecture and the built environment to the Department for Communities in Northern Ireland. So, Graeme, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm assuming I just press share screen and I can get... Um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> it's working. Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, just add a little bit to what Kevin was uh, saying about my background. Uh, since 2012, when we set up Pro Social Place, uh, my co-director, Rhiannon, is a psychology professor, and our interest is in the psychology and the well-being of places after a career of, uh, of, de of designing uh, and stewarding places. Um, I've always had an interest in that, but the, the agendas we have now about health and, and well-being have uh, managed to bring things to the fore. And I think the interesting thing about today's um, question or challenge um, of um, the, the looking at cities as a gallery is that I've always looked at cities as a gallery and people in it as players within that gallery, sometimes a stage definitely playing out lives in, in, in uh, different, uh, different ways and, and different dynamics. It's only later in my career I realised that most other people don't. They're interested in uh, very many other things. And perhaps that's why so many places are, are actually failing, uh, particularly failing our health and our well-being. So perhaps um, these conversations, uh, particularly with the city of Belfast, and if Belfast can take some of these thoughts uh, forward, we can start making um, better places and coming up with better models of places. Uh, so when Christine was talking, I was thinking about uh, the word ethos and how a place if it has the right ethos and everybody is, is bought into that, um, that we can start to build better places. So today I want to talk about, sorry, I forgot to check on my clock, but 10 minutes from 14 minutes past. Um, what I really want to talk about today, the key message is about flow and movement and connection within cities uh, and, and, and across people, because that is essential and important for well-being. If we can't connect, we can't connect well and appropriately, we're not going to have uh, good, good well-being. So on this first slide, I have some images here that I first came across when I started um, uh, my education as an urban designer. Uh, and it's serial vision from Gordon Cullen. And what he's talking about here is walking your way through a place and how the scene the physical scene actually changes and draws you forward and, and, and changes the mood of place. It's very physical, but it does have um, that cerebral impact on people. We respond to, to places through, through these uh, changing scenes. But the important thing here is that we've got to remember that we're not doing this as individuals. We're not individual and, and separate. We are actually social animals and as social animals, we need to cooperate for our well-being and there are plenty of studies around showing uh, particularly in the eastern bloc uh, during the civil wars of a few decades ago young children in um, orphanages not thriving actually dying when there was not enough human contact for them they got food and warmth and everything else it did not have uh, that connection so it's really important for all communities to be able to uh, cooperate and connect with each other. 
And the most important place that this happens isn't within buildings, it's without buildings, it's in, it's in the public spaces. And this uh, statement from Demos, from some research that they've under, undertaken, uh, suggests 85% of people uh, know and understand that. I think the other 15% just need to think about it a bit more and you would have 100% of people recognizing that the public realm uh, is extremely important to us uh, as, as people. But it's a contested space. It's quite a contested space because it's a space under control. Um, and my bugbear is that it's mostly under the control of highway engineers who don't feel any sense of responsibility to anything else other than moving traffic around, but also being risk averse as well. And those two things, that colonization of space by machines and all the paraphernalia that comes around those machines and the uh, over safe way that that is managed has a very big impact on our uh, capacity to to connect. We actually lose our agency. Uh, our, co our ability to cooperate is completely muted. And what we have added in, which is quite a nice thing to see in this uh, image, is Joy Road or happiness. And lots of people are talking about the happy city. Well, happy is good. It's great to be happy. But we have to understand the different kinds of well-being that we have. And happy is a hedonic well-being. It's OK, but it's not great for a sustainable life. We need eudaimonic well-being. We need meaning and purpose in, in our lives and, and in our places. And if we come back to movement, we'll think about how that flow works. And the two little red images on the top left are from uh, Kevin Lynch and his image of the city, his, how we perceive cities. Um, our, our movement is actually natural and it's an ecological approach. That's how cities uh, originally evolved. And it's also empathic to human need, whereas the motor vehicle isn't that um, empathic a way of, uh, of moving around or, or connecting. In addition to that, uh, Lynch also talked about landmarks and edges and districts and, and how we uh, draw up our cognitive maps of places, what's important to us. And, in this, and particularly in this image of, over Belfast, is the importance of bringing geography and people together. Places are, are unique, there's a uniqueness uh, and the ubiquity of highways and how we are building cities is actually moving in the, in the wrong direction uh, for, for our natural uh, ecology. When places become dysfunctional like that, uh, like I think most towns and cities are now inundated with cars or communities under pressure, there's a public kickback against that uh, and LTN's low traffic neighborhoods have, have come to the fore as a way of overcoming cars. But the problem with that is it shoves the cars into somebody else's space or into your own space. So you may get a low traffic neighborhood, but the high street where you need to go out and meet and interact with other people and become a community or a society it's even more inundated. It's been given over to something. There's a loss of agency control there. And simply greening something as well is, is also a knee, knee jerk reaction to something without understanding what green means, what nature means. And we need, and I think as a, as a, a community of interest on here today, we need to think a lot deeper than those knee, knee jerk uh, reactions to things. They're absolutely understandable. It's a perfectly normal ecological reaction to uh, pressure, but it isn't good enough and it will lead to uh, greater problems just down the line. So I'd like to introduce you, if nobody's heard of Lawrence Halpin before, he's a landscape architect uh, from the 20th century. Um, he was interested in the ecology of form or the ecology of place or the bringing together of uh, landscape geography and people, he went out and studied natural forms. He interpreted them in modern materials within city spaces. So it's almost a, a form of early biophilic uh, design, but I think it goes a lot further and is, is a lot more interesting. His wife was also really interesting as a dancer and they worked together. And he started to think about uh, the concept of urban choreography, the speed in which we move through spaces, how we actually physically move through spaces, the repose, the dance, uh, the interaction that we have on, on that. And also he, he, he put together um, a, a model of our 
VP cycles, which is about bringing resources uh, uh, to, together, value action of those resources and, and, and performance. The key thing around that is action, it's movement, it's bringing things together, it's making things happen, it's, it's a dynamic thing, it, it's not something static. So I think for everybody, there's something really interesting and important to uh, go back, consider and learn from the work of Lawrence Halprin and how we can actually make our, our, our cities better. But moving on to nature as well and, and, the, and the greening issue, biodiversity is, is really very, very important to us, but not in our conscious everyday lives, but we do need these things happening in the background. Partly, the sound of birdsong, which I think most people uh, who live in cities probably uh, realised was so much of it around when lockdown came and vehicles calmed down and the place got quieter. You could hear how much birdsong there was. But actually, there's probably more birds moving into the city as well during that time as a, as a, as a safer place. And it gave us more connection to it. But I live in Liverpool. You. Uh, a lot of you live in, in Belfast, seagulls are actually really important to us. If you live in the middle of the country, you're less likely to hear them. So then again, it's that individuality of places and, and their geography. But the spirit of trees I've put up there is a really important one, uh, particularly in Liverpool. It's a project I'd like to get moving soon. Um, villages have always beat the bounds and planted particular trees around their, their periphery. Uh, and you know that they trees have significance for that, but coming from Liverpool, trees also are also significant in shipbuilding, in commerce, in getting around the world. Particular timbers came from the Baltic and the Baltic area of our city. Particular pieces of tree we use for rudders, uh, others for masts, there's, uh, others for packing cases from around the world. Trees we have used for millennia and we will continue to use. And I think this is, there's a spirit of trees to celebrate. Uh, and there's a, there's a manufacturing and use of trees that we could celebrate as well. So a tree is more than a pollution mop, which is how it's being sold at, at, at the moment. Uh, my penultimate slide is about urban design and how we'd like to treat malls as a gallery where you're passive, you sit down, you're more or less putting art on a plinth and I think it needs to be much more than that, that it has to actually flow through people's lives. People must be participating, uh, not just simply watching things and it needs to go beyond the high street it needs to go all the way down the streets and lanes that we that we live in uh as as well um also there's there's two there's two important things here as well this is also well well-being derived from hedonism and, and there's not necessarily a great deal of uh of meaning in this. You can have an ice cream and a sugar rush and feel even better, but it's also controlled. There is something about the shopping experience that's controlled and it's not real life and it's not sustainable and it's, it's not, it's, it's necessary, but it's not, um, it's not the thing that gives you a, a rich, rich life. So my final slide and in conclusion is that places are spaces with meaning and that's a geographer's term. And I think it's a really important one. But the image I started with was Gordon Cullen that was actually looking at the physical shape of, of spaces and cities and how you move through them. This final slide is how you um, experience um, these things, the smell, the touch, the texture, the sound, the things that attract and the things that repulse as well. This is a feeling uh, way of cities and, and I think that's something we can get into. So picking up on something Kevin discussed yesterday is what do we do with this conversation? How do we take it forward? Uh, and I think there's a project here uh, in actually going out as groups with communities, as artists, as, as designers, as the authorities to actually walk around and have conversations in Belfast and actually look at what is interrupting the flow. What is interrupting the flow and the connection of communities? And that's my provocation for today. Thank you. Graham, fantastic. Um, that was really great food for thought. And so we'll go into conversation and begin to explore um, more of the ideas around it. So Graham, thank you very much. Um, places are spaces with meaning.
Um, I was uh, fascinated by that and many of the other uh, concepts that you, that you talked about in there. So now conversation time. So we're going to go into breakout rooms. The, the question that might help us get started is how are we currently approaching designing the visual landscapes of our cities? So in a way, what's, what's happening already um, that you know of and what do you think about those approaches? Oh, hi there. Welcome back. I realize Zoom is very unforgiving. It's either on or <laughs> off. You're in a room or out of a room. Um, and we have we have little flexibility when we decide the timings. Uh, but thank you for, for sticking with it. And I'm hoping that that was a useful entry into some conversation. Um, so what I'm going to ask is for a few people, we have uh, time for a few key points. What was the one thing that jumped out at you? Um, um, I might just jump in then, Kevin, and just since we were just saying it a second ago. Thank you very um, much. Uh, no worries. Uh, so I suppose in our group, we were talking the importance about um, not so much just focusing on like bringing, you know, crowds in and like, you know, trying to uh, activate public spaces through engagement rather than entertainment was an important aspect of Graham's talk there to us. And about getting people involved as a act of like participation and connectivity rather than just and like uh, I think one member of the group actually said it quite nicely that you're not just a consumer, you're a citizen, you're taking part in your city and your community. So that there is like an importance on focusing on like projects or events that have a longevity and an engagement quality than just arrive see something listen to something go again so especially like the impact on the environment and stuff with those and maybe getting like participation and engagement more the environment of the city than just once-off events and things so i think that was an important thing that came out to us in our group so uh, thanks very much tara wendy did you want to was that a hand up i saw <laughs> it wasn't a hand up but um there was a few interesting um, conversations in my group, um, and the one in particular was Amberley, if Amberley would like to, sorry to put you in the spot, Amberley, but the idea around a 15 minute city, and it was really, you know, looking at the neighbourhoods and having a, a city where you can access all the amenities within your area within 15 minutes, and it's a Parisian concept, and Amberley, I wondered if you would like to have a wee bit of a chat about that, which is fun really interesting um yeah Wendy that that was it really so I'm just really interested in well in our group um we had been discussing like disconnect um because of the makeup of, of the built environment um and the way that Belfast it we have the city center and then we all go home out of the city center so um I just put forward the notion of the 15 minute city which is a Parisian um concept um, I believe, and yes, as Wendy said, that it, that the city becomes a series of neighbourhoods and that you don't need to take several buses across the city. You can cycle down the road or you can walk 15 minutes um, to school or to the dentist or the doctors or the supermarket and get everything that you um, might need. Um, as well, Wendy, will I mention... Oh, actually, I'm just going to... Uh, um, <laughs> I have a book here which I'm reading and um, there's a quote which I really love. I didn't have this to hand especially for this but I'll read it out. Um, Small local places are the stage on which a good sustainable and satisfying life unfolds um, and that's by it's a book um, called by Cormac Russell which is really interesting Rekindling Democracy it's back to front but I'm sure you get the idea and then we were also um, we were also thinking um, about because this is primarily about um, the visual landscape. And I mentioned a project um, which Place had produced um, a couple of years ago, because I used to work at Place, um, along with a couple of other people that are on the call here. Um, and it's a really gorgeous project. And the website is called staringonstreets.co.uk. And it was produced, it was commission, a commission um, with a few different artists. And it highlights a lot of, a lot of the um, artisanal, um, 
often overlooked parts um, of our visual environment and I think it's really appropriate to this discussion. Yeah, because we did talk about looking up at, you know, the architecture in the city and some of the beauty of the architecture is actually even if you look up and um, kind of like mini little balconies and all that you can see around the city. So we felt that that was interesting. And we did talk around the whole disconnect with the city, which is, you know, been an issue for a long time, like the West, West Link being a barrier, Dunbar Link, you know, being a barrier to... So we did recognise there's been a lot of good, you know, um, initiatives that have happened to bring the Titanic area closer to us through the, the walkway, the footpath walkway across the rivers, uh, the river. And... Um, um, can I just bring in Paul Kelly? In our session, he was, um, uh, we had really great people in our, our, our session, I must say. Um, uh, but just Paul brought in a few kind of really good uh, words and uh, with regard to signifiers and so on. Paul, can I just bring you in, please, to say a few words about that? We were um, discussing the, the, the drivers in, in a city of, of, of being focused around business and commerce. So thereby, um, we capitulate a lot of our, our space, our visual space, to advertising, to messaging, to, to billboards, to, to things that we don't have a say in, in what is being expressed to us. Um, so um, a lot of the discussion was around uh, we give a lot of that away. So when we create a space, we're creating time for people to be able to, um, as one of the earlier speakers said, not have to consume while you're, you're sitting. Um, so it's, uh, it's not transactional. It's, it's the idea that you can take a space and use it, be there as a family, be there as a group, be there um, for uh, whatever time that you want and, and the space uh, accorded uh, to that doesn't mean that you're being sold um, to. So it's, a, it's an ownership idea, the, the, the idea of, of, of um, you already own the city, the city is there for you. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be transactional when you're, when you're there at, at that moment. Other places that, 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 that remove billboards, all the advertising, it has a huge impact on, on, on how we interact. You think about places like um, uh, there's a great example in South America where they removed all advertising and it had a huge impact in, in the visual sight lines down streets and um, that you can see beautiful buildings, people start to appreciate them again. It, we're very lucky in Belfast in that we can see the mountains. We're really actually a rural city, uh, if you think about it in, in, in that way. Um, so there are signifiers like the bridge that brings us into the big fish. It's a nice introduction and on your cycle in in the morning if you take that. And um, we have the river that comes comes right up and through the city. There's lots of opportunities where we can where we can um, connect and um, how we use the city with our natural in, environment and try to offset some of the damage of, of that Dunbar link and the concrete circles that, that, that we have and create this little island um, where, where it's a very um, uh, decisive action to go into the city centre. You know what it is that you want to do and, and the, the appreciation that you have for what, what that space that can give back to you rather than going in, get your shopping done, be sold to and leave as quick as, as, as possible. Q made a good uh, point, point in, in that living in the city centre and um, we're now seeing it it's a good thing, you know, pubs encroach uh, coming out um, and being um, outdoors, but it's also encroaching. It, it, that's not space that's being taken away from cars, that's space that's being taken away from pedestrians. So we just need to think about that and make sure that we're not putting an extra pressure on, on, on places where you can stand without having to drink or buy or consume or, or so that there is still space left um, in the city. Thanks very much, Paul. And um, I just uh, that picks up a little bit in what I see in the chat there. And please do use the chat again <coughs> if you have other ideas from your uh, from your groups, because we're going to move on now. But I see that Stephen has talked about this kind of thing about, about the difference between what you might be called as the artist and the citizen, and wondered why that was. I think uh, I think it's what Stephen's asking. 
and whether this sort of uh, approach is going to kind of uh, begin to think about you know artists as citizens I suppose and, the, and not always having this thing about someone going into town to be a consumer but be more of a participant and I think that builds in your idea Paul around the, the sense of ownership so thank you all for that I think uh, we just want to move on now and please if you have other points do put them in the chat because we will save the chat uh, and we will produce some kind of uh, highlights of the key points from this which we will definitely send to you uh, when the series certainly by the time the series is completed so we're going to have another um, uh, two provocations one after the other um, so we're delighted first of all to be uh, to be uh, joined by Anita Durst and Haley Ferber from Shashama in uh, in New York. Anita, uh, uh, if, if you don't know Anita, she's been part of the avant-garde art scene in New York since she was 18. And she founded Shashama in 1995 to create a place for artists free from financial and uh, subjective constraints. Um, she's worked tirelessly for over 20 years and, and she secured over 1 million square feet of space in New York City for artists creating vital cultural capital across the city. Um, and then Haley is, is a cultural leader and, and curator and an arts educator who supports Anita in the day-to-day -day operations and strategic planning uh, of Shashama. So she's the deputy director there and they're, they're both joining us from New York. It's kind of about 6 a.m. for them, <laughs> but you're very welcome, Anita and Haley. Uh, so we'll just over to you. Excellent. While Haley's getting the presentation up, I'm going to ask everybody just to like take their hands and just kind of go like that in the screen and just put your hands and just stretch them out. So the reason I started Chishama is because I wanted people to feel connection and to do things outside of the box. So I think right now we're all connecting in a way and stretching our arms and movement is very important. So Chishama has art, space and connection. Uh, next slide, Haley. These are our current locations throughout Manhattan. We have about 40 locations. All these locations are donated to us on a temporary basis. Uh, some I've said we have for over 20 years and some we have for three months. But most of the spaces that we have now, we've had for over three to four years. Continue, Haley. Next, Haley. There we go. Ah, so with these spaces, we give them to artists for free. And in exchange, they teach art classes. So we have these free art classes in the Bronx, Washington Heights, and Sunset Park. Next, Haley. We also give presentation spaces. So we have about 110 presentations. We reach a huge audience. And these presentations are opera, dance, theater, anything you think of it, we will allow you to do it. Next. We also give workspace to artists. Uh, so we have a, a very large, uh, many workspaces throughout Manhattan. Uh, we also have office space and rehearsal space. Next, Haley. Uh, you know, after COVID, we were able to really come together and put a lot of artist in space and, and have artists in windows uh, doing dance. And uh, so when people, so it didn't feel so shuttered in New York, I believe our next slide is a little video of that. Here it is. So Make I added work. I added some images. Here's the video. All right, so, all right, so those uh, images were the of the artists and here we have the video of it. Sorry. Want me to play? Yes. Okay. Da, 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 da. Go. Support Shashama to enliven New York. I love Sir Shadow. He was our first artist ever 25 years ago. Stuart Mayer, ride inside. Come and dance your heart out with him. Daryl Thorne, beautiful, elegant of the night. Sarah Nagel, she was there for two months. Oh my God. Support Chishama and help us support artists. Vanessa Long Dance Company. My goodness, what is she doing with those bags? Say la vie. 
support to Shama so we can transform unused space. Okay, so now you can cut that off, Haley. Uh, so that gives you an idea of some, some of the kind of art that we were doing during the pandemic. We put live artists in windows to enliven the street. Uh, we have a really a very clear vision of what we want to do over the next two years. There's going to be a lot of empty space and we want to put a lot of artists in these empty spaces. So we're working with uh, business owners, the bids, the government. Uh, foundations to really take on, uh, right now we have 40 locations and we hope to take on another 60 in the next two years. Next, Haley. Uh, these are our funders and our partners, a lot of the major property owners, and, and then we work with a lot of, uh, you know, smaller nonprofits in New York, um, just to give you an idea. Okay, Haley. Uh, so this is our mission. So we, we work with property owners and they give us space and we give it to artists. Okay. And here's our budget. So basically uh, our budget, you see we have subsidized rentals that helps support us quite a bit. And, and then uh, that's one of our spaces that we've had for 20 years. We have a lot of our, our studio artists in there, foundations, government, and our gala, and then how much it costs for us to do it. And I think that's the end of our presentation. Ah, very good. <laughs> okay, we are completed. Thank you so much. Open Sinira. for questions. Yes, Did we uh, actually, what would be lovely if you don't mind, um, we'll just move on to Gemma and Ralph and then we'll have some questions after that. If you're okay perfect. with that, great. I am so, perfectly good. <laughs> excellent, thank you so much. But. Uh, Gemma and Ralph uh, are joining us. Uh, they're based and working in Belfast um, at the moment. Um, and they're going to talk about some of the projects that they're doing in Belfast. But Gemma, Gemma if you don't know Gemma, uh, she is a freelance practitioner. Uh, so she believes in the power of heritage and the arts to transform lives and build sustainable places. She is part of the team at Daisy Chain Inc. Uh, which is currently reimagining the Belfast entries through creative interpretation. Ralph uh, Alwani is uh, his design interests lie in architecture and placemaking that has the potential to promote people's health and well-being. He is part of Urban Scale Interventions, which is a new form of creative agency responding to changes uh, in the way we live, work, and play through people-centered design. So, Gemma, Ralph, uh, lovely to have you here. Um, floor is yours. Um, yeah, I'm Gemma and uh, Ralph is joining me on this. We are going to focus on the Belfast Entries projects we're, we're working on at the minute. It was supposed to be completed by now, but has been prolonged by the pandemic. Um, hoping that our presentation will really demonstrate one of the first things that um, Graham actually said in his first presentation of the idea of artists being innovators, not just illustrators in the city. Um, so at Daisy Chain, we describe ourselves as placemakers and cultural agitators. We believe that cultural spaces matter, but things need to change because they don't always demonstrate their full potential. So we're about utilising the arts to transform our cultural spaces into vibrant, relevant and playful centres. This project in Belfast Entries is the first opportunity we've had to work in outdoors public spaces. And I have to say it's been a fantastic learning experience for us. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, so we're USI and essentially we're a multidisciplinary team based in the city um, and we work on city challenges to create public value. Um, so we've been delivering the uh, in, engaging in the lighting policy within the city in this case and delivering a series of lighting pilots. Um, so we essentially use co-design to engage with people, uh, finding purpose and then responding to place. And we do that through cultural policies, public space and well-being and co-designing policy and strategy. Great. Um, the Belfast Entries Project is one of a number of interventions following the bank building's fire in 2018. That created a cordon that forced pedestrians to find different routes for regular journeys. The entries therefore saw a significant increased footfall despite their dark, dank, dirty, and sometimes threatening demeanor. And Belfast City Council commissioned a creative placemaking team to begin to address these issues, including the two of us. So for Daisy Chain, this quote from Kieran Carson, who we feel wrote the city the best, came to embody and guide our approach throughout. The entries represent the foundations of the city as a mercantile and industrial hub. 
the modern footprint of the city centre still follows the plantation town set out 400 years ago. But perhaps more importantly, the entries have been in our spaces of encounter, and this came up um, quite strongly as an important in cities in our last breakout room. Stepping into the entries feels like a moment away in a different world. In these spaces in between, new possibilities are created, protest and dissent flourish and emerge. Here's where we can demonstrate what makes Belfast unique in all its eccentricity, anger, bitterness, vitality, irreverence and absurdity. And for us, street art is the perfect medium to do that. It's a language we in Belfast already understand. So we've commissioned a number of artists from across Ireland and across the water in the UK as well to help us with regenerating these entries. The first stage was commissioning four local artists to create Easter eggs, which are little tiny invitations to explore and play. These examples from Peter Strain, who chose to highlight lesser known characters from the past and Ruth Crothers, who created a vibrant and intricately detailed tribute to the mercantile heyday of Belfast, printed on linen in honour of that once dominant industry. And the main illustration is broken up into six separate postage stamps, which are created, scattered across the entries and create a playful challenge. Our larger artworks are still in process. We've had five, six installed so far and five more will appear in the coming weeks. Each artist has drawn inspiration from the history and culture of the entries to develop truly unique and nuanced responses. This is Rob Hilkins' piece, inspired by the Northern Star newspaper, which was described as a planet of light and heat. It was founded by the United Irishman and printed for a time in this entry. Nomad Clan's Art Deco Feel re reflects the history of the Pottinger family, which had connections with the Far East and gave the entry this, its name. The short poem from local poet Gail McConnell helps us communicate some of the complex inheritances of that heritage. Um, and these poems are used to introduce each of the entries. Um, this piece by Anatomics highlights the plight of the red shank, a wetland species endangered by habitat loss. Species such as these made Belfast their home long before the city was even imagined. Um, we've never intended for the meanings of these various artworks to be immediately apparent to the viewer. We're not trying to deliver a history lesson, rather an invitation to explore and know differently. But the artworks are supported by a series of interpretive panels. The graphic concept of these echoes the narrow linear quality of the entries themselves and is restricted to a striking black and white palette. As I said, um, we are used poems by Gail McConnell, specially commissioned for the project to introduce each of these entries and they're at the top of these panels, recognizing that people will only stop for a few moments at these and we want to use those poems as an invitation to read further and explore further. We've also used specific words or terms in the text alluding to the inspiration behind the artworks nearby. So I'll hand over now to Ralph who will explain the lighting element of the project. Yeah, so our, our journey actually starts from integrating co-design within Belfast City's new lighting strategy. Uh, next. Oh, Gemma, you've Sorry. got control. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hold on two minutes. <laughs> um, so what, what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to create lighting uh, that, that doesn't respond to people. Uh, next. Um, so we undertook an engagement process that worked with stakeholders across government departments and, and, and the City Hall and uh, more importantly we engaged youth and citizens to tell us what they feel about lighting and how it should respond for them within the city centre. Next. Um, so what that led to is setting a scene, uh, a kind of a group of typologies of how lighting could be transfer, uh, transferable, site specific, pop up, how it created kind of connection between night economy um, and, and connectivity in the day, vibrant streets, safe streets, and really developed shared space. Uh, next. So what, what we did uh, uh, from that is we developed a set of uh, design principles, design principles that uh, could be en embedded into any kind of lighting pieces that were undertaken, even as part of the tendering process uh, for the city. Um, and that was about creating uh, co-designed approaches that establish wayfinding, allow space for events and performance that are distinct to the city and, and also create the opportunities for connection. So next. Um, and how that translates back into the entries um, in terms of Castle Arcade, um, what we're, we're looking to complete this year is working with an artist called Squid Soup is we're using the concept of a, a, of a river that run under the arcade. And we first started by creating a, a transferable piece called the River Runs Beneath. 
we're now uh, taking that away and we're working with the the artwork there um, from Daisy Chain and we're basically creating this this rainfall sculpture that allows through integrated sound for for artworks and artists to kind of communicate through the lighting which is also quite tactile as pedestrians walk through that kind of closed void next um, the kind of another one of the projects we're doing is within wine cellar entry um, and we've actually tried to take a sustainable approach for this. So the weird object that you see there is a, a 3D printed uh, functional street light um, from recycled ocean plastics. And 40 or so of these are going to be suspended within the entry, integrated with sound as well, picking up on Graham's discussion about uh, focusing more on, the, on all the senses. Um, we're going to play with the concept of wine bottles, you know, the blowing on the top of the bottles, which will bounce and interact with the light um with, within this entry next um and then again directly responding to the kind of punk theme if you like um of one of the murals that's been developed in crown we're working with a thunderbolt that go that's going to connect through the through the long entry um and will respond with light kind of being transferable from one point to the to the next and next <laughs> Um, so I guess what, what we've tried to show here is, is through cultural interventions and, and deploying lighting within the entries, that from starting from the strategy itself and, and working with communities to really define um, how we set principles of, of, of something that's distinct to the city, looks at wayfinding, is, is playful and interactive, can take what can be sometimes mundane uh, infrastructure like lighting and, and really allow it to, to speak to the city narrative. Okay, I'll pick up here um, because I think Ralph, this links on well from what Ralph was saying anyway about how involving creatives and projects like this for us opens up new possibilities for these spaces and new ways of seeing them. It allows different perspectives and nuances to come to the fore. Um, but most importantly, we kind of feel that what we're doing acts as an invitation to know and understand these spaces differently and to think about your place in the city and its potential futures. For us, um, the entries have always been and will continue to be spaces of encounter between insider and outsider business and um, public agencies, economic, social, cultural and environmental needs, past, present and future. So it's what we do with the energy that's created in those counters that matters. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to pick up on that, Ralph, as well. No, I think I think that dovetails nicely between the two. So maybe the last slide. Yeah, this is about some of the challenges that are emerging because people are responding very positively to what we're doing here. I think it's been really obvious to us that people really care about these spaces and want things to happen to them. Um, but it's really important to make sure that all the pieces are in place and all the stakeholders are involved along the way. And um, the middle picture is a uh, business moving out into the entry and it's exactly the kind of thing we wanted to see that people change their gaze back to these spaces. Mm -hmm. So they're not just placed to put the bins anymore. But you can see how what they've done here is interrupting the piece that we've installed and also just pedestrian flow. Um, so it's, the need to work with those businesses is really important. Um, it's also clear that most a lot of people still just treat the entries as a toilet and a place to get high. So um, that's a larger infrastructural problem to deal with. And one of the other businesses, the picture on the right there is around a business again responding positively and um, doing their own kind of improvements to the entry but they've actually just this week painted out one of our pieces and um, so we're going to have to open up a conversation with them about that. Mm. Um, I don't know if you want to add any challenges that you foresee or obstacles that have come your way Ralph? No. Yeah no I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think what these um, interventions have the ability to, to do is try and change that mindset but I think what you've just demonstrated is you know that difficult challenges to overcome and um, you know on the other end it's something that we've we, with Belfast City Council we've also found that um, you know trying to coordinate stakeholders and landlords and stuff like that to create these changes in this environment um, you know are challenging in, in themselves so we we're not just transforming the public spaces. So I guess it's also a, an issue of transforming cultures and, and the way of doing things as part of that. Absolutely. Thank you, that's us. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I picked up really that, that, that there are a lot about this is about change. And I think change is very much on the agenda. So that, that's really encouraging, thinking about how the ways into cities, the ways we might reanimate 
and reconfigure spaces, especially through the arts, is uh, I think very encouraging. But your last point there around just changing culture and, and changing perceptions and all sorts of things, I think that's quite powerful. That's probably what we're all engaged in. So a couple of minutes for some questions in the usual pattern. Um, uh, try to throw your hand up or virtually and if you're not getting attention, Morvan, I see you immediately. Maybe you could say, ask a question. Thanks, Kevin. I was just thinking um, in terms of uh, that last slide you showed, uh, Gemma, of the artwork being painted out and the conversations that we were having in the previous group, um, I was, Ralph was in the previous group about change and constant change and, um, and how to kind of expect that and not to maybe kind of put a permanence on anything. Um, I wonder, uh, what the dialogue is going to be with that. I mean, is it such a bad thing that it was painted out or do you just want to make sure that there's a conversation around that? Yeah, it's it's just that it was unexpected to us. Um, so we want to engage with those businesses and make sure that what we're doing isn't interrupting what they want to do in those spaces too. Um, it was also surprising to us because Joy's, um, and Joy's entry celebrates the heritage of the McCracken family and the piece that they painted out was of Mary Ann McCracken. So, to our mind, it supports what they're trying to do. And um, as I say, it was news to us just a couple of days ago. So it's yet to unfold what those conversations will be with them. But that's our immediate response to engage with them and find out what's going on. One question I had maybe for, for Anita was, um, I was fascinated by the fact that you had brought so many partners, I mean, partly Gemma's talking about that now, but you brought so many partners together. You're at a stage where a lot of the relationships seem to have been built. And I wonder if there's any learning from that, um, that you know, any things that you might want to say about that process, um, which I think a number of us are engaged in here, maybe at an earlier stage, I don't know, in, in Belfast. But um, I wondered what you thought about or any, any learning from that, Anita? Uh, so learning from our partners is that um, uh, many of our partners come back to us year after year to continue to work with us. And I believe that is because we are very careful with our partnerships and we are we work very closely with our artists and we really listen to what the property owners want uh, to be able to give, you know, to help them, their, their goal is to rent their spaces. And so therefore uh, bridging the line between the artist wants and the property owner wants. And we've been very successful at making those two things meet. Thank you. Time for one more question, perhaps. Anyone with something burning they'd like to say or ask? I, um, if nobody else wants to jump in, I had a, a quick sort of reflection on, yeah, on the, the, the second presentation. I thought it was really mm. fantastic, really inspiring to see the entries being used in that way and to have artwork. It's, it's brilliant. Um, and my wonderment was like, can we, it's obviously expensive. You, you need um, commissioned artists, um, et cetera. And the, you know, we've only got so many um, entries in the city center and that's all great. But what I was thinking is we have all these alleyways all over Belfast that are generally public toilets and places to use drugs. And if we could take that model, but do it with the, the actual residents themselves doing the art and maybe if there was like a cheap way of doing some form of lighting infrastructure to make the place more observed and therefore safer. Um, I just thought it was maybe an alternative or a complementary thing to think about alongside alley gates, which I know are very um, topical at the moment. <laughs> Better mute myself again. <laughs> I love that blah, 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 mum. <laughs> Um, sorry, Ralph, Gemma, or indeed Anita or Haley, anything to, to comment on on there or, or responding yeah. to that idea? De definitely. I think that's something we're definitely exploring and in, in dialogue with Belfast City Council, um, particularly through the cultural strategy and some of the projects that are emerging through that. We are looking at the knowledge transfer of, of some of these city centre sites and how they can 
uh, be used to transform on a neighbourhood level and, and how, how citizens and, 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 and neighbourhoods actually take ownership and lead on that. Um, so from a lighting perspective and, and, and indeed from other placemaking components and perspectives, it's, it's certainly something key on our agenda as we uh, look to deliver projects over the next couple of years. I have to say that um, we've been really pleased to see Belfast City Council take on board some of those conversations that are coming from local neighbourhoods and looking at ways in which they can encourage and make it simpler for people to use those spaces um, outside their front door or outside their back door. Kevin, would it be okay if I say something? I don't know how to put a hand up. Or... Well, you, you just did. Is that okay? <laughs> and just off the back of um, what Kerry was saying and then Ralph and Gemma, um, I totally love the entries project. Um, I have been, I've just got news this morning, I've been working with a trust on a um, proposal for a research project about residential alleyways. So it's quite different from the entries project, but hopefully com complementary. And I just got word this morning that the trust has um, awarded us funding to take on that piece of research. Um, I can't say too much about it, but it's um, hopefully going to, the idea behind it is that there's lots of um, public information that's held in a quite, quite a private way. And it's trying to extract that information, make it public so that people are more encouraged to be able to use these spaces. Um, and what does adopted alleyways mean? And what does unadopted alleyways mean? And, um, uh, so looking into that a bit more um, and hopefully we'll have a bit of a, public program around it as well. So there'll be a lot of debate and discussion. Um, so can't say too much more about it, but the announcement will come next week and um, hopefully we can reach out to everyone then. Oh, well, that's a shame. You're not gonna do an expose now, um, you know, other than the thing you think you can't, no, just joking. Um, I could... Thanks very much. No, <laughs> so thanks very much. A... Well, I've, got this, like I've got this PowerPoint just behind you. No, 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 you're fine. Um, okay. uh, yes, so... I need to go ahead. Uh, so I think right now there is a really large, you were talking about people smoking pot and, and like and peeing in alleyways and, and, you know, we have taken over buildings that were in bad neighborhoods. And when we go in there and we turn on the light and we create a positive energy, it really changes the neighborhood. So I know you, you're talking about working on the exterior but of the buildings, but if there's a possibility and a way to to uh, work with the property owners to, you know, a lot of buildings are now shuttered and there's a negative energy, but to be able to take those closed up spaces and to put art in them or small businesses is really, this is a great opportunity and a great thing that um, it could really change some of those spaces and those locations. Yeah, and that's a very powerful point too. I think Anita, the fact that the inter what you do in the space is, is almost as important. Last point there, if you're saying, oh, Rhiannon, you have joined us, I think. I have, yes, thanks, Kevin. Uh, no, I'm unmuted. Um, okay. I'm sorry I had to miss the first session. I was really looking forward to it, but I had a last minute te teaching, remote teaching session um, allocated to me. So I'm sorry about that. I really loved what I've heard in the second session though, and it's good to be able to enjoy to join now. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, picking up on, on the points around um, um, behaviour change, really, uh, to stop people weeing and taking drugs in the alleys, um, and uh, agreeing with what the previous speaker just said, in public health, it's always been a real challenge to try and change behaviour with particular focuses on individuals and the behaviours that they're doing. And we really believe that, you know, it's, it's quite obvious that if you change an environment, you're going to cause a change in behavior. It will naturally happen, but it might just take a bit of time. And so changing the environment is by far the better way of changing what we might consider unacceptable behaviors than trying to prevent people in sort of more individualized ways. So, you know, I think, I think it's just naturally going to happen with all the great work that's going on in these, in these entries. Lovely to hear about them. Thanks very much, Rhiannon. and you're very welcome. Delayed you were able to join us. So, um, uh, and there's lots of stuff happening in the chat. Please continue to use that, but we're going to move back into um, 
conversations now. And we have about 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes to have another conversation. And really my my simple thing when we go into uh, breakout rooms is to say, what are our next steps together? I'm getting a really strong sense of uh, the, the possibility and potential for change. So what are the next steps we need to take together um, as you go in? Uh, and then when we come back out, we'll have time for, you know, some, you know, key points that come out. Um, but uh, hopefully Lindsay will put us back into breakout rooms now. Good luck. Hi, everyone. Uh, apologies again if Zoom is very brutal <laughs> throwing us out. Uh, but any key points that came up? Uh, we were having a discussion about how do you, now that we're having this pandemic and you have so many artists who are hungry and need money, how does the government take that, take the, I mean, many people need money and, but how does it take the money that it has and the empty spaces that it has and but it has many things and, and bridge all those things together and, and creating that uh, economy and the cultural energy and and so how does how does it happen so that was the question we were talking about and we were i was wondering if people here at the, the city council that we're talking to has uh, um, programs that they're starting to help bridge these gaps anybody from belfast city council and tourism culture heritage and arts want to pick that up um, I can say um, something on colleagues, please can input. Um, I, I guess what we've managed to do within our cultural strategy is secure um, core funding of two and a half million pounds that's multi-year for our arts organisations and festivals. Um, and that's on the back of having a really robust plan, which, um, you know, many hundreds of people input to um, and sort of cross party support of our council. Um, and as well as that, we're working um, to look at programs such as, you know, the entries project. We're looking at Christmas animation and all the projects that would, we'll be doing fun palaces and, you know, we're commissioning bursaries um, around our music um, strategy and bid for UNESCO City of Music. So there are lots of ways in which we're creatively trying to support individual artists, as well as the kind of core arts organizations across the city, which support that whole ecosystem. Um, you know, that it they all kind of um, really need each other. And we do, do totally recognize in the city council how hard it is for the cultural sector at the moment. And um, to just think, you know, one month, six months, ahead and nobody really knows the exact answer to these big major questions at the moment but um all we can do as a as a city i suppose is try and influence our central government as well um you know uh, associated with um stormont and their executive um and also work um kind of cross border as well look at other options in terms of our work look European city networks that we have um, internationally and just kind of um, develop the capacity and the ability of our arts organizations, artists and festivals and creatives um, kind of work more collaboratively and um, find other revenue streams and just survive this horrible time. Um, it's never gonna be enough. We're never gonna have enough cash on the table and I know from, from a kind of local government's perspective with um, over 70% of our income coming from, um, you know, um, rates that are, that are paid by the, you know, the, the businesses in the city, um, you know, we will have our own issues to face into. The positive thing and why I'm, you know, still so enthused about um, the projects that um, the council's working on is that, Council has adopted the Belfast Agenda, the Boulder Vision, this cultural strategy, and is really keen on a cross-border level to support culture. And they recognize that um, it's, you know, culture as a driver for transformation of the whole city. 
um, you know, across all the different kind of you know, layers of um, sectors of society. So I do feel very passionately um, upset about what's happening in the cultural sector at the moment. And I really feel deeply the situation that many of our individual artists and organizations are in. But um, the best that we can do is keep going and push through. And if we can survive and demonstrate how powerful culture is as part of our recovery and our recovery framework, um, and just try and do our best to work collaboratively in that way. I do think we'll, we'll try and come out the other side in a more positive place. And met, some people have said that this is kind of like a new buy house and a kind of global sense of it. And that's creatives will have more of a voice and more of a power and a role in that transformation of cities. Um, sorry, I've, I've talked on here a wee bit, but um, it's just something that I'm totally aware of um, and totally recognize the need. Um, four cities um, across the world to take on a more kind of leadership enabling um, role and I'll be quiet now. Thank you Kevin. No no good to hear from you and of course it's not always about cash either. Um, no. Some of it's about more broadly enabling. Time for uh, one or two more final thoughts. Um, can points. I just pick up on that from the responses in our group because I think it connects quite well to what Christine just said and um, the general feeling in our group was that interventions led by council such as the Belfast Entries project um, are great uh, because they spark something else so they should never be intended to be permanent necessarily that they're just the start of something and the need for public agencies and large-scale business owners to be responsive as people respond to what they have started and accommodate that and allow for things to grow and evolve over time. Um, we talked a lot about how great it is to think of the concept of beauty through utility, which came across really strongly in Ralph's lighting solutions and the importance of cleansing spaces, of going back to basics, decluttering, opening up views and allowing people to flow through spaces, but also spaces to dwell. Reason. I think uh, this is Anita again. Hi there. Uh, I think we were also talking about how do you incentivize the property owner to donate space? Um, and we were talking about that uh, there was a property owner and he gutted his space because it was cheaper for him to have a gutted space as opposed to keep it uh, functional because then he didn't have to pay taxes on it. So looking at the incentives, for uh, donating space to artists and, and, and what can those incentives, um, how could that help to, to create more of a cultural landscape? Thank you, Anita. Yeah, so, and also, so oh, sorry, Kevin, just also the, the, the other thing very connected to that is that it became aware that the council officers and them didn't know, had, had had problems finding out who owned the buildings. So the, there's like a really simple kind of fix there in terms of an audit of like who owns what buildings in the city center so that uh, that could be a resource to people who want to approach um, building owners, whether that be for murals or for use of the inside or any kind of stuff like that. It, it just seems a bit mad that even the council doesn't know um, who, who owns who owns uh, the, the, the physical infrastructure, you know? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure that's a challenge in lots of different places, actually. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But, um, and thank you for that. And I'm sorry, kind of, I just want to draw it a little bit to the close because we are heading towards 12 and people inevitably have even more Zoom meetings after this. Okay, so it's time to say goodbye. I think you can do that in the traditional way. So it always appears to me to be like a sort of a BBC show or a, a, a podcast show in the States, Anita, if you know what that, that is, and, and Haley, you know, where everybody goes, bye. So listen, you please uh, go on to your day with great purpose and uh, imagination. Uh, it's lovely to see you all, but we'll finish the session there now. So all the best. Yeah.